Hello students, today we're going to look at the topic of momentum. Now you might think of uh, momentum when it comes to sporting events. Uh, if your team, let's say the Cleveland Browns, uh, if we're talking about momentum, they have absolutely no momentum at any point in time in the existence of the program it seems like. So if we're thinking of momentum, we're, we're talking about something that keeps on going and if we have a successful team and they're doing very well, they're going to be hard to beat. It's, they, they have some momentum associated with them. Well, in physics, what we're going to do is we're going to define what momentum actually is. We're going to define what impulse is and how uh, you would definitely want to know uh, what impulse is when it comes to uh, bungee jumping or uh, let's say if you're going to jump over a fence, you're going to want to know what impulse is. If uh, you're ever in an accident, you're going to want to know what impulse is. Uh, we're going to apply impulse changes to momentum. And then at the very end of this, we're going to talk about applying the conservation of momentum uh, to a closed and isolated system where we would describe it uh, as either being an elastic collision or an inelastic collision. So those are the things that we're going to talk about in today's lecture. All right, so let's start. If we're talking about the physics definition, we, we have this idea of what momentum is when we're talking about sports programs. Things uh, are going to continue moving, advancing ahead at a good rate of speed. Uh, it's going to be hard to stop. Well, if we're looking at the physics definition, we're talking about an object. Well, if we have an object, that object has to have mass. All right. Now, if that object has mass, that object has inertia. So if our sports team isn't doing very well, they don't have any momentum. If I have a box that's sitting on top of a shelf here, all right, if it's not moving, is it going to have any momentum with it? No, it's not. But the moment that this book on our shelf here, which has mass, starts moving, it now has momentum in this direction. All right? So momentum is the property of moving things. If it's moving, it has inertia. It's in motion. So if we have this mass and it is moving with a specific velocity, then we can figure out how much momentum this object actually has with a simple formula. We take momentum equals mass times velocity. Now the units of measurement for these, we know that mass is going to be measured in kilograms. Uh, velocity, it depends on what we're looking at. If it's moving very slowly, you wouldn't use miles per hour. Uh, we might use centimeters per second. But the standard of what we're going to use is going to be meters per second. Now, the nice thing with momentum, we don't have to remember a new unit of measurement. Like when we were talking about force, you'd have mass times acceleration, and then we'd come up with a new unit called the Newton. Well, here in momentum, the unit for this is just simply going to be rewriting kilograms times meter per second. We just rewrite what we have. Now, our, our variables that we're going to use for this uh, it, it's pretty straightforward. Mass, it begins with M, so we're going to use M. For velocity, we're going to keep using V for velocity. But there's a small problem here when we're talking about momentum. See, we've already used that letter M, so we can't use that anymore. So in physics, what we use is kind of like a little uh, slanted P. All right, Don't ask me why we use P. That's just what the the standard is. All right, so we use P for momentum. All right, now let's dive in a little bit deeper. If we're trying to describe momentum, we know that we have an object, and in this case, we have a big boulder. That big boulder, if it's starting to roll and it's moving, it has momentum. So if it's moving faster, all right, if we have a 10 kilogram boulder, that wouldn't be a boulder, it'd be like a big rock. Uh, and it's moving at one meter per second, we know that we'd have 10 kilogram meter per second. But if that same exact boulder were to pick up speed, if it were to double in its speed, what happens to its momentum? It doubles as well. 
All right. So the faster uh, moving boulder is going to have more momentum than the slower moving boulder. And then, of course, if that boulder all of a sudden came to a stop, that boulder would no longer have any momentum. And why is that? It's not because the mass changed. It's because the momentum changed because there is no more velocity associated with it. All right. So let's check your knowledge here. A moving object. What does a moving object have? Well, a moving object, we know that it has to have some sort of velocity, right? So that's going to be it. If we have a moving object, we have kinetic energy. Check. And if something is moving, it also has momentum. So what's our answer here? Our answer is going to be that, oops, sorry, uh, is going to be that it has all of those. All right, let's do another check here. We have when the speed of an object is doubled, what does its momentum do? Well, we already looked at that. Now, let's say that you can't remember this. Just throw in some easy numbers. You have one kilogram times one meter per second. We know that that's going to be one. All right. And then if you have that same object, and in our case it says that our object has doubled in speed, just simply put in two. So you have two kilogram meter per second for momentum. So our answer for this is that the momentum doubles when our velocity doubles. The next idea, this idea of impulse. Why do we want to consider impulse when you're jumping over a fence or if you're going to be bungee jumping? Well, impulse is going to involve a change in momentum. If you are standing on a fence and you jump off the top of the fence, so here I am standing on top of the fence here, if you jump off of that fence and land stiff-legged, all right, maybe some of you guys have done this in the past, you land stiff-legged, what does it feel like? When you land stiff-legged, it feels like it sends a lightning bolt right up your back, all right, and why is that? Because you have some momentum as you are coming in contact with the ground. Your mass is moving at a specific velocity, all right? So you have a mass, it's moving at a good rate of speed, and what's going to happen is you are going to land and your momentum is going to change. You're going to stop. You're going to stop moving, all right? But when you stop moving, if you land stiff-legged, you land and you stop in a very short period of time. What that does is that imparts a very large force on you. And you feel that as that shock wave, as it rides up your legs and into your back, it hurts. So the idea of impulse, why is it important when you are bungee jumping or you're uh, jumping over a fence, you're skydiving and you're landing? Well, what we would like to do is you, instead of landing and having only a short period of time, how about this? If you take that exact same scenario, but now when you land, you land with your legs bent. If you land with your legs bent, you're extending the time that you're changing your velocity. So what does that do? That lessens the force that you actually feel. All right, that's why in parkour, uh, they always tuck and roll and tumble. It's because they're trying to reduce the force of impact that they feel on their body by extending the time through which it's being applied. So that is impulse. Now, taking that idea over to bungee jumping, all right, you jump off of a bridge, you've got uh, uh, the safety equipment tied to your, to your uh, ankles. Well, what, what would be safer? A chain? that's never going to break, or a bungee cord that's going to stretch. Well, if you jump off of a bridge with a chain attached to you, you're going to stop extremely fast. And when you stop extremely fast, what are you going to impart onto your body? A huge force. It's going to probably rip your legs off. All right. But instead, if you have a bungee cord, that bungee is going to stretch. It's going to impart that force over a larger period of time and you're not going to have those legs ripped off of you. All right, maybe that's exaggerating, but it's going to definitely hurt. All right, so uh, uh, that hopefully wraps up our idea of what impulse is in a nutshell. 
So let's look at a couple other examples of this. If we have the greater impulse exerted on something, you're going to get a greater change in momentum. So if we're looking at this idea, we have a car that's going to be pushed. You can only impart a certain amount of force. There's only so much effort that you can apply onto this car. All right. So if you apply that force through a very small period of time, the mass of the car is going to remain the same. But what happens to the velocity? Are you going to get the car moving very fast? No, you're going to have the car moving at a small velocity. But if you impart that same force, I'm going to try to draw the F to be the same size. <clears throat> Excuse me. If you impart that force now over a longer period of time, the mass of the car remains the same, right? We're not going to change the car's mass. What happens to its velocity? The velocity gets bigger. So the greater the time frame that you are imparting a force onto an object, the greater the velocity that you're going to get out of something like that. We have our first question with impulse. When the force that produces an impulse acts for twice as much, the impulse is. All right. Now, if you're not quite sure of this, let's, let's throw in some numbers. We know that force applied through a period of time is going to cause a change in momentum. Now, this little triangle here, that hopefully remember that from uh, before. That means change in delta V, change in velocity. Let's say you're not sure what, what uh, this answer is going to be. Let's throw in just some generic numbers. You have 1 times 1 equals, we'll say 1 kilogram. What's our velocity going to be? It's going to be 1 meter per second. So it says that we're going to apply twice as much time, right? So if we have 1 newton times now 2 seconds, the mass does not change. We're going to keep that same mass, right? So what happens to the velocity? The velocity has to double, all right? So a lot of times what we can do is we can just throw in some easy generic numbers and then see what happens instead of trying to guess at it, all right? So it's gonna double. We have some cases where uh, this impulse can change momentum. The first case, if you're in sports and you're playing a, a game of golf or you have, uh, let's say, baseball, how do you get the ball to go the furthest distance? Well, if you're wanting to increase the momentum, you want to have the greatest amount of force imparted onto that ball. What you would want to do is extend the time of impact that the golf club or the baseball bat is actually touching the ball in, in golf or baseball. So if you are imparting that force through a greater period of time, what that's going to do is that's going to increase the velocity of that ball. So what we do is we follow through with our swing. We follow through, or not with our swing. Well, it would be the swing of the golf club and the swing of the bat. All right. So that's going to allow that ball to travel at a greater velocity. And uh, if you're like me golfing, it'll end up somewhere in the the shrubs to the right with my wicked slice, okay? All right, let's check our understanding here. We have a cannonball shot from a cannon with a long barrel will emerge with greater speed because the cannonball receives a greater what? All right, so if we have this cannonball and it's sitting inside of a barrel here, if it's a short barrel, we know that there's a certain amount of force that this uh, propellant is going to be, you know, exerting onto the cannonball. That cannonball, as it's being moved through, oops, grab the wrong thing. If it's moving through here, it is experiencing that force only through a short period of time. So if we look at the same idea of that car being pushed, if it's being, if that force is being exerted onto that cannonball, for a short period of time, what's our velocity going to be? It's going to be small. If you have now a longer barreled uh, cannon, you have the same propellant, the same force, but now, now that force is being exerted onto the cannonball for a longer period of time, 
if our time is increased, our force stays the same, our mass stays the same, what has to change has to be the velocity. Again, we can try this out with just some simple numbers where we have one second and then we have our mass of one kilogram. That would be one meter per second. But if we change this now, where inside of the barrel of your cannon, it's gonna be in there for five seconds. If you increase that, the mass of your cannonball doesn't change. What has to happen to the velocity of the cannonball? Well, it has to increase by quite a bit, okay? So you're gonna have the impulse that's gonna be changed. The impulse is changing. All right, let's look at case two. Case two, uh, if we're looking at impulse changes in momentum, uh, let's flip it to the opposite of what we were just talking about. We said that we would follow through with something to increase the velocity but how about if you want to decrease the momentum over a longer period of time? Where would something like this come into play? Well, if you were going to be uh, in, a, in a boxing match with Mike Tyson, are you going to want to lean into the punch? If you lean into the punch, here's Mike Tyson's fist as it's hitting you. Okay. If Mike Tyson is going to hit you with a large force through a short period of time, then we're going to see that you are going to have uh, a bit of a black eye. But now, if you have that change, oop, and I should draw my velocity a little bit bigger than that, okay, because it's going to be a rapid change in velocity. If we impart that same force, he can only hit you with so much force. Now, you faint away from it, you change your velocity like this, okay? Now, and I should have left my V alone. I don't know what I was thinking. All right, so what we're going to do now is if you increase that time, you're going to extend the time through which that velocity is going to, uh, of his fist is going to actually slow down. So that's why in boxing, they faint away from it. Or if you were, say, I think it's on, uh, I have another picture that's going to show, uh, like a car, if a car is going to have an accident, why at motorcycle races, why uh, when a motorcycle gets into an accident, why are there bales of hay around the corners? Why don't they just put up a concrete wall? All right, well, it's to extend the time through which we're trying to slow that object down. All right, so we'll get to that in a second. Then then it'll be a lot prettier than my, my uh, letters there. So it says, a fast-moving car hitting a haystack or hitting a cement wall produces vastly different results. Why is that? Well, uh, do both experience the same change in momentum? Both of them are going to stop, right? So our change in momentum, that is going to be the same. They're, they're both going to stop. We're going to have two objects that are going to stop, so both of those cases would be true. Hitting a haystack or hitting a cement wall, we're going to have the same change in momentum. It's going to stop. Do they both experience the same impulse? Well, remember, the formula impulse, force times time, equals mass times change in velocity. So these two things fit. It says, do they both experience the same force? Well, here's the deal. You hit a cement wall, that force, you're going to stop through a very short period of time. You're going to have a huge force of impact. It's going to hurt. But if you have a haystack now, that extends the time through which you are going to be having that change in momentum. So that's going to uh, you know, have a lesser impact force on you. You're not going to get hurt as much. All right, we have uh, the next thing. It's coming up on Thanksgiving. Let's say a dish is going to fall on the floor. All right. Will the change in momentum be less if it lands on carpet or if it lands on a hardwood floor? So... You have something that's falling off. It's going to hit the carpet. It's going to hit the carpet. The carpet is going to slow the dish down at a slower rate. It's going to experience, or I'm sorry, with, with a longer period of time, slower rate, a uh, longer period of time. So that means you're going to have a smaller force that's going to be experienced on it. 
Whereas if it hits the hardwood floor, it's going to be a very fast change in speed, imparting a large force on it. So what are we looking at here? Both of them are going to come to a stop, right? So if both of them are going to come to a stop, then they're both going to experience the exact same change in momentum. Okay, here's my, here's my car uh, picture I was talking about a moment ago. Uh, you have a car, it's out of control. Which would you rather hit? A haystack or a concrete wall? Well, it makes sense <clears throat> that haystack is going to slow you down over a greater period of time, thus, thus reducing the force of impact. Whereas if you hit a cement wall, a cement wall, yeah, it's going to stop you very fast, but it's going to impart a very, very large force on you. It's going to hurt. Okay. Another example, this is our Mike Tyson one. If you are going to uh, be in a boxing match with somebody, don't lean into it. You lean into it, yeah. The time of impact is going to be very short, but that has to exert a very large force onto you. No one wants to take a punch like that. So what you do is you faint away from it. You faint away from it. That extends the time through which that force is going to be applied, thus lessening the force that you experience. When you jump over the, the uh, fence, you bend your knees. If you're skydiving and you land on the ground, you don't want to land stiff-legged. That's where uh, skydivers break their legs if they land stiff-legged. It's not a pretty, pretty sight. All right, we have another case here. If you are wanting to get into karate or you want to break something very uh, quickly, well, in order for you to do that, you have to apply the largest force that you can over the shortest time interval. That is going to get you the greatest uh, change in uh, the, the bricks that are being broken. You impart the greatest force when you apply it through the shortest period of time. Okay. All right. How else can we apply this idea of impulse? Well, if something is going to be bouncing, if something bounces, it's going to be hitting numerous times. If something's hitting numerous times, you have that impulse being applied at multiple points. All right, let's go on to the, the next topic here. Hopefully you have an idea of what uh, momentum is, what impulse is. So how about now we look at a closed or ice, closed and isolated system. So what this means if a, when we're talking about a closed and isolated system, we're, we're not going to have any outside forces interacting with this cannon right here. All right? So we don't have any wind. We don't have anybody else pushing something. Uh, we don't have inter, any energy that's being lost. So we're only looking at the system being just the cannon and the cannonball. We're not looking at anything else happening, all right? So the law of conservation of momentum simply says that in the absence of an external force, the momentum of a system remains unchanged. If I have before, before this thing is shot, it's not moving. It should be pretty simple to get our, our amount of momentum the amount of momentum right here before it's shot is zero. It's not moving. There is no momentum. So this is the before right here. So I'm going to put before. This has to equal the momentum after it is shot. All right. So after it's shot, the cannonball, it's going to be moving this way. Okay. The cannonball is going to be moving this way, so it has a certain amount of momentum. Now, how can, if, if this thing right here, let's just make up a number, let's say 10 kilogram meter per second, and it's going to the right. How can we go from zero beforehand, and then we have zero afterwards? Well, if the cannonball goes this way, which way does the cannon go? The cannon is going to go in the opposite direction. So if this 10 is positive because it's going to the right, we'd have to look at the cannon ball or the cannon itself. It's going to be going in this direction. 
Now it has a larger mass, I shouldn't do that. It has a larger mass, so it's gonna have a smaller velocity, but that velocity, whatever that's gonna be, it's gotta be a negative value of the cannonball. So if we add those two values up, we got negative 10 to the left, positive 10 to the right. That means that we have, after the cannon has been shot, it has a momentum, total momentum, in this system of zero. And that's what we had beforehand. So that matches up. That's the law of conservation of momentum. So when a cannonball or cannon is fired, the force of the cannonball inside of the cannon is equal and opposite to the force of the cannonball in the cannon. The cannonball gains momentum while the cannon gains an equal momentum in the opposite direction. That's the cannon's recoil. So no external forces were present, no external impulse is present, and no change in momentum is possible. All right, now that's the before part, right? The before part and then the after part, we have to have an equal change in momentum, equal and opposite. So the internal molecular forces of a baseball, uh, it's going to come in, in pairs. So if you have a baseball right here, you have some forces that are pushing out, some forces that are pushing in. Are those uh, forces, if, let's say if you don't like the idea of a baseball, let's say like a balloon. If you have a balloon, there's some internal pressure pushing out and external pr pressure pushing in. Does is that have any bearing on your your balloon that's moving? No, it doesn't. Okay. So the molecular forces within a baseball have no effect on its momentum. All right. So that balloon, if the balloon is moving, the air pressure on the inside of that balloon of an unpopped balloon is not going to change its momentum. Uh, let's say you, you're in your car, your car is moving along, and you push on the dashboard. Are you changing the car's momentum because you're pushing on the dashboard? No, you, you have no effect on the movement of that car, okay? So collisions. Collisions, for all collisions, in the absence of external forces. So we're not letting any outside forces affect our system. The net momentum before the collision is going to equal the net momentum after the collision. And this right here, this is what I looked at with that uh, cannon being shot. The cannon being shot, we know that if we had a mass, and we're just going to, you know what, let's just put in some quick numbers here. We have 10 kilogram... Uh, 10 kilograms times a velocity of zero meters per second. You have zero, kil if I get this, zero kilogram meter per second. Now that has to equal the momentum afterwards. The momentum afterwards, if the cannon weighs nine kilograms, and we don't know what the velocity is here, and we know that the cannonball would have to weigh one kilogram, so we're just going to put in some generic numbers here to make this kind of easy. So if our velocity of the cannonball is 10, all right, if that's 10, we know that, oop, meter per second, we know that this guy has to have a momentum of 10 kilogram meter per second to the right. That's the momentum of the cannonball. So what does this velocity right here, what is that velocity of our, of our, uh, cannon, what does our velocity of our cannon have to be? Well, this thing has to come out to be a negative 10, doesn't it? Negative 10 kilogram meter per second, because if we have a conservation, if it has a con conservation of zero, then we're going to have to have our uh, velocity of our cannon going backwards, going backwards. It'd have to be something like, I think it's like negative 1.1, something like that. That's rounded off. But it's got to be negative 10. This is a conservation. Conservation, zero. These two added up, zero. We don't have anything uh, being added or subtracted from the beginning to the end. Our types of collision. We have an elastic collision. An elastic collision occurs when colliding objects rebound without lasting deformation or any generation of heat. So this is like our bumper cars that you go to the to the uh, to Cedar Point or to the fair. Two objects that are coming in contact, they hit each other, they bounce off of each other. 
Uh, we'll look at a formula for this in just a little bit. And then we have an elastic in, sorry, an inelastic collision. Inelastic collisions, these are where the objects are going to collide together and there's going to be a deformation or a generation, some generation of heat. So we can kind of think of these as two railroad cars as they come in contact with each other. They couple together and they're stuck together afterwards. All right. So examples of elastic collisions. A uh, car moving at 10 meters per second collides with another uh, car at the same, of the same mass at rest. So what's going to happen? Well, we, we can use this idea of uh, conservation of momentum, that whatever our momentum is beforehand, it has to equal the moment, amount of momentum afterwards. So if our car was traveling at 10 beforehand and it hits something with an equal mass, all right, so now we have twice the mass, what's the velocity going to be? Well, if it hits something with twice the mass, it's going to cut the velocity down by half, all right? Now, if we did the math of this, we have 10 ahead of time. You cut it in half because we had twice the mass. Now we have five. So conservation of momentum. Let's check our understanding here. We have a freight car is moving toward an identical freight car B that is at rest. When they collide, both freight cars couple together. Compared with the initial speed of the freight car A, the speed of the coupled freight car would be what? Well, if it has uh, an identical mass to it, we doubled the mass. What has to happen to the velocity? If they are coupled together, it has to be cut in half. <clears throat> if we're going to figure out some more complicated collisions, uh, sometimes collisions, they're not going to just occur in a straight line path like those uh, railroad cars. Sometimes what you have to do is you have to use some vector diagrams to help identify where these things are going to go. So if you remember back when we did the, the vector diagrams, our free body diagrams, trying to diagram out what is going to happen, well, we can figure that out mathematically. All right. So another example of where we could use this conservation of momentum Instead of two things hitting each other, how about if you had something that exploded apart? If you have a firecracker, what's the momentum here before it blows up? The momentum before it blows up is zero. Oh, I put my unit of measure in wrong. Zero kilogram meter per second. And then afterwards, what does the, and this is before, what does our momentum afterwards have to be? The momentum afterwards, it has to equal zero has to equal zero. So this guy right here, if we'd say that this would be 10 kilogram meter per second, what does this one over here have to be? That one has to be negative 10 kilogram meter per second. Because these two things added up together, what do they have to equal? They have to equal what our momentum was beforehand. Zero. All right, so they have to add up to be the same. So what we should do is start coming up with a formula sheet for this particular unit. So if we look at momentum, we're going to use that P for this. And what does momentum equal? Momentum equals mass times velocity. So we're going to have M times V. Now there are slight changes to this formula. If I were to say what is the change in momentum, I'm just going to put the little triangle in front of it. So if you have a change in momentum, that means that you can have a change in our velocity like this. Notice that nothing really changed except we need to consider uh, what our final and our original velocities were. Now, that change in momentum, what can that change in momentum equal? That change in momentum can equal the impulse. Impulse, sometimes people write it down as just I. Impulse equals a force applied through a period of time. So force times time. Now, what we can do if you have all of this written down, I know this looks kind of confusing, but it really doesn't have to be. See, if you know the change in momentum, 
what does it also equal? That change in momentum equals the impulse, doesn't it? If you have the mass times change in velocity, what does that equal? That equals the force times time. So as long as we have the formula written down here in the black, we can use any part of this. I can say this equals that. I can say this equals this. I can go backwards and I can say that this equals that. All right, so having a good formula sheet written down, it's gonna help you out immensely. Now, let's look at the last formula and then we're gonna be finished up. Uh, if you have what's called an elastic collision, all right, so if you have an elastic collision, you have two masses. We have one car here, and you have another car here. And these two things, they're going to be colliding together, let's say like this. This guy has mass, and it has a velocity. This guy has mass, and this guy has velocity. What is going to happen is these two things are going to collide together, and let's say that this one bounces backwards, and then this one bounces backwards this way. They're not going to stick together. So afterwards, this guy has momentum, this guy has momentum, and the only thing that we'd want to do is you'd want to make sure that you identify that this is our velocity beforehand, and we put this little... Uh, tag in the front like this or behind it like this so that'd be our prime or our first one so that's our first velocity and then over here this would be the after velocity so these numbers they have to add up to be zero and we're going to do more of this if you watch my video on uh, the math of this you're going to get into this in more detail uh, equals plus all right and then we have the last thing and then i'm going to stop if you have an inelastic collision. In inelastic collision, you have two objects that are going to be coming together. Okay, so these two things are going to come together. I'm going to leave that off. We have mass times velocity plus mass times velocity. Let's say this guy, uh, in this particular example right here, our velocity for this at the beginning, uh, let's say that that velocity at the beginning is just sitting still. So the velocity here is zero. And after they come together, all right, so this would be like two railroad cars that are going to come together. Here, when they come together, you would add up the two masses together, right? Because they're, they're stuck together and they're moving at the same velocity. So these are our formulas that we're going to need to have. You don't have to have like a perfect uh, understanding of what the formulas are at this very moment in time because in the video that I talk about the uh, math associated with this, I'll go over every single step of it, all right? But for right now, make sure you have these formulas written down and they'll help you out a lot, okay? If you have questions, concerns, make sure that you always uh, get a hold of me and I'll help you out through those. All right? Uh, that'll do us for today. All right. Take care.